I'm Sharon Sobel Jordan, President and CEO of the United Way of Greater Cleveland. Welcome to the second session of our 2023 Community Conversation Series. The objective of these conversations is to provide a forum to raise awareness and increase engagement on important topics in our community. Each of our voices matters and has the power to create change. I would like to thank IdeaStream Public Media for moderating today's session. I would also like to thank WOVU for simulcasting this afternoon's discussion live on 95.9 FM. And thank you to our community partners for their support throughout this series. Today's topic is the State of Greater Cleveland, the release of United Way's Community Needs Assessment. Here at United Way of Greater Cleveland, we release our community needs assessment every three years. We do this to examine issues and conditions affecting greater Cleveland residents and use this data to inform our grant making, policy, and programmatic work. We are grateful for the partnership of the Center for Community Solutions, a nonpartisan policy and research think tank that works closely with us to gather and analyze data and prepare the report. Our last assessment was completed when the pandemic was still in its early stages. COVID-19 exposed deep disparities in our community, especially around education, healthcare, and unemployment. It also brought systemic and structural issues related to race and racism to the forefront of the public conversation. At the same time, the pandemic led to some innovative solutions aimed at helping employers retain their teams, providing supplemental income for families, and increasing wages for workers. These rapid crisis responses offer important insights about promising solutions to some of our community's most pressing issues. We are so pleased to have a panel of local experts here with us today to discuss the findings in the report. The panelists are knowledgeable about how our community is addressing these issues to improve the health, economic, employment, and educational outcomes for all greater Cleveland residents. They also bring important perspectives on how we can optimize and scale the many strengths and assets in our region. We are privileged to have Marlene Harris-Taylor as our moderator. Marlene is the Director of Engaged Journalism for IdeaStream Public Media. She directs community-focused news coverage for IdeaStream and leads journalism initiatives that address opportunities identified in and by Northeast communities. She also manages the Connecting the Dots Between Race and Health Project and is the host and executive producer of the podcast, Living for We. And with that, I will turn it over to Marlene to begin today's conversation. Thank you so much, Sharon, for that introduction. And thank you, United Way of Greater Cleveland, for hosting this series of events and for inviting me to moderate this critical discussion. We also want to thank my employer, IdeaStream Public Media, and WOVU 95.9, who will be streaming today's conversation. Now, so that everyone understands how we, inter how we will interact as a community today, we begin with questions that I prepared for today's conversation. There'll be a public question and answer segment at approximately 1240 PM, when questions from the community will be heard and shared with our panel. You can start asking your general questions at any time during today's program, and we'll make every attempt to get all the questions answered. You can text your question to 216-307-5632. That's 216-307-5632. Or if you're listening on Zoom, you can just type it into the Q&A box. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our panel of experts. Today, we're joined by Gregory Brown, Executive Director at Policy Bridge, a nonprofit that monitors urban policy issues and informs regional public policy debates by framing issues of relevance to the African American to African Americans and other underserved communities. Mr. Brown is also president of Brown and Associates Consulting Services, working with philanthropic, public, and nonprofit organizations. 
Emily Campbell is Chief Operating Officer at the Center for Community Solutions. Ms. Campbell oversees research, policy, and administration-related activities for the Center for Community Solutions. An expert on issues relating to poverty in Northeast Ohio, Ms. Campbell has consulted with numerous nonprofit foundations and government agencies to provide data and public policy decision support. Jacob Doritsky, Vice President, Strategy and Research at Team NEO. Mr. Doritsky leads research and strategy for the Northeast Ohio region's business development efforts. His primary responsibilities include analyzing the regional economy to provide greater perspectives on the challenges and opportunities in Northeast Ohio, developing strategic and coordinated actionable insights to encourage economic growth and providing a perspective on how the Northeast Ohio economy can better perform. Welcome everyone and thank you for taking the time to lend your expertise and perspective to today's dialogue. I'm going to start with you Emily. Let's talk about the community needs assessment and there were uh, three focus areas and can you kind of frame for us those three focus areas and what was considered in those? Absolutely, I'm happy to. So the Center for Community Solutions has had the honor of partnering with United Way of Greater Cleveland for several years on the last several needs assessment. And each time we partner, we're able to dig a little bit deeper into data on community conditions to help us understand the things that people in our communities may be facing, where there are areas of opportunity and challenge, and where we might be able to invest some resources to make a real difference. So in this particular needs assessment, it's organized around three areas of interest. And those are economic mobility, which includes things like early childhood education, income progression. It also looks at housing stability, finding that we have a large number of people in our community that are struggling with housing affordability, particularly female renters and older adults. And then finally, taking a look at health pathways, looking at differences in life expectancy for different groups within our community, as well as community conditions like food insecurity, healthy environments, and of course, behavioral health, a growing area of need. All key important areas, and, and it's a lot. So Emily, tell me what stood out to you in the report? Like, was there something that was surprising to you? Absolutely, you know, there's a number of, of very interesting things in this report, and I hope that our panelists will also share some of the things that stood out to them. But there are a few things that our team uh, really found interesting. The first is that this is the first needs assessment that included data gathered after the pandemic began. So a lot of the data was collected in 2021, that's the latest available right now, and starting to get a sense of how the pandemic may have changed things. But what stood out to us is the fact that not that much has changed. Hmm. Cleveland remains a high poverty community. We stay second worst in, of large cities in the country so, for so poverty. So that number hasn't changed? That was the same number as before? It's the same rank, yes, yes. Um, and, you know, the pandemic, we see greater disparities. Uh, some people more challenged than others, which I'm sure others will talk about a little bit more. Um, but one of the things that we noticed is that the efforts of local organizations and government really blunted some of those negative impacts of the economic downturn and of COVID-19. And we see that very clearly in this assessment, how those interventions and responses helped people stay out of poverty, help them stay in their homes, as some of that assistance has been turned off over the last uh, year or few months, we're very concerned about what our community may be facing in the coming months. Yeah, it's kind of unknown right now. Let's go with Gregory. Let's talk about the same thing, Gregory. What did you think about the needs assessment in terms of the results? And was there anything in there that was surprising to you? Uh, thank you, Marlene. Um, I, I think overall, I thought the needs assessment gave us a thorough and robust look at the conditions based on what the data indicates. Um, what I was surprised by is the lack of progress that mm -hmm. we've actually been able to demonstrate through indicators at the population level. I think we spend a lot of time, energy and effort crafting solutions to problems, but they don't necessarily demonstrate themselves at a population level kind of result oriented uh, process. 
So uh, for me, that made me think about, okay, so we, we're spending dollars, we have assets, we're doing things positively to move the needle. Um, why aren't we seeing that kind of catalytic action at the population level among broad sectors of our community? And that's one of the questions we have to start to answer because if we don't get movement that way, we won't be able to ever get out of this number two, number three, number one, top 10 in poverty, which we've been in for the last 20 years. Wow, that long? I yes. didn't realize it was that yes. long. Mm -hmm. Well, before I move to Jacob, let me ask you, dig a little deeper on that question. So what do you think it is? Because as you said, we're spending dollars. And I know that everybody in this community is well-meaning and really trying to move the needle. And everybody's measuring their impact and, and all the things, all the things, right? Yes. So what do you think it is that's keeping the collective effort of all the different people and agencies who are trying to move us, uh, you know, better, get us in a better position? Yeah. What do you think is holding us back? Wow, man, that's the uh, $64,000, million, dollar, trillion dollar question. But I, I think I would address it as this. I think that we do a lot of good work. And a lot of good work happens, but it's kind of episodic and it's blunted by the systems and structures that are above them and the policy that come down and the practices that reinforce racism and other kinds of activities that don't allow people to flourish and optimize their potential. So I think if we're going to think about a solution to a problem, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but mm -hmm. I think we have to think in a, in a couple of dimensions. We have to think about what do we do immediately to blunt the impact of the dire circumstances that, and the conditions that happen for people daily? And then how do we look systemically to change structures and systems so that they now become beneficiaries of what we can do as opposed to barriers and challenges that block what people can do? And that means we have to kind of work at both levels. It's a, it's a both and proposition. Um, it's not either or, and it means that we have to also think about the expenditures of large sums of resources and commitment over time to make that happen. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, I was looking at one report just the other day from the Fed at Cleveland. It said to eliminate the racial uh, wealth gap between blacks and whites, uh, it would take 259 years if we go on our current rate. Did you say 259? 259 years. Wow. So that would be 20, 20, 25, 9, or 2259. Um, you know, that's just unreasonable. And, it's, and, and you can't expect people to be that patient that long. Mm -hmm. So we have to be a lot more uh, urgent and a lot more uh, diligent about the things that we do in that regard. Well, you know, Jacob, turning to you, uh, income inequality, that's something that one of the things that can help in that area is jobs, mm -hmm. right, and good paying jobs. So uh, what, is, what is your reaction, first of all, to the overall assessment and the results, and, and was there something that surprised you in there? Yeah, well, I, I think, unfortunately, uh, not surprised, much like Emily and Greg, um, uh, and uh, I don't think we're going to be surprised in the next three, five, seven, or ten years, to Greg's point. I mean, these are structural issues that are going to take a long time to overcome. Um, but you point to something, the disparity, particularly in, in earnings, um, that is so critical to, to trying to solve the talent challenge that we have, and in some ways has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and I think we have to start in a different place in terms of how we think about the economy. Uh, we publish a report every year called Misaligned Opportunities, um, which looks at uh, issues of uh, equity and race in the most in-demand job sectors of the economy. Those are good paying jobs, low risk of automation, family sustaining wages, um, projected growth over the next 15 to 20 years. And for the last three years that we've done it, 19 of the top 20 jobs have been underrepresented by African Americans, the mm -hmm. largest uh, portion of the minority workforce mm -hmm. in Cuyahoga County and in Northeast Ohio. Um, we have to do better. When you look at women uh, in relation to uh, the top 20 occupations, 15 of the top 20 are underrepresented uh, in the most in-demand occupations. We have demand. Think about three sectors of the economy alone, manufacturing, healthcare, and IT. Tons of jobs, 55,000 to 60,000 or so, going unfilled by Northeast Ohio residents. And the reality is, um, and, and I'm not trying to sound defeatist, but if you look at the demographic trends we faced as Greater Cleveland, as Northeast Ohio, the way we define it, 
we've lost 170,000 people over the past two decades. Um, labor force is down by 150 to 155,000 people. So we're not simply going to grow our way out of this challenge in the short term. We have to think differently about how we connect the people who are here to opportunities. And I think we need to think about it, uh, as Greg said, uh, really from a systems approach and give it the proper complexity that it needs to solve some of these challenges. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to see these numbers changing anytime soon. And systems approach, you know, when we say that, sometimes it's so, so overwhelming, right, because it feels so big. But I'm wondering, Jacob, as the business community locally, are they thinking outside of the box yet? I mean, they're facing this big dilemma. Yep. Are they saying, well, maybe I need to start some education programs myself for folks, or maybe I should dip into some communities that I've been hesitant to hire or anything like that? Absolutely. Some are, some aren't. Um, but I'll tell you for the most innovative ones and the ones who I think are having the, the most success in attracting new and different labor force, they are absolutely taking the long-term strategic view of that. So what does that mean? I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, we work with a technology company who uh, was located in uh, a far suburb of Cuyahoga County and made the decision to make an investment in the Midtown area. Um, technology company uh, generally thinks about hiring people with an associate's or bachelor's degree. They did two things very differently. They located in Midtown along a transit route. Mm. Because they were intentional about where they wanted to be, the first year that they were there, uh, minority applicants went up by 20% in their company something intentional. The other thing they did, they removed the BA plus and associates plus uh, job requirement for a strong majority of their roles. Started thinking about the skills that people had, the on the job training that could take place. Again, grew their significant pool of applicants because it, the BA wasn't just, uh, we're screening people because, yeah, you made it through four years of school, you probably have enough skills to get through this. It was thinking harder and deeper about it. So that's a company who took it seriously. Um, but uh, there's another manufacturer who, and some of these things are a little surprising to us when we have these conversations, but a manufacturer who was docking a cohort of pay, uh, a cohort of workers pay for like 30 minute increments every single day. And during the pandemic, finally decided, well, why is this happening? It was because the bus route showed up mm -hmm. at 6.37 and the shift mm -hmm. started at mm -hmm. 6. Mm -hmm. And something as simple as having that conversation said, okay, we'll start at 7. You've made their lives easier. You've made production easier for yourself. So it's not always an a incredibly challenging solution to some of these problems. I'm so glad you said that because I've always wondered about, I mean, I understand that sometimes companies move where the land is cheap and it's easy to build because it's flat, but then it's like, how do people get there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm so glad to hear that some companies are thinking about, maybe I should start putting my facilities in the city. Well, it's not just, it's not just time, risk, and money, right, which is the traditional way people think about yes. making investments. Um, we think about it through the lens of, uh, you know, ESG. We call it ESG plus P, and you have to start thinking about the environment, social responsibility, um, and you have to think about it through the lens of place. Uh, if you need workers, there's a, a huge value proposition to be in the city, to be yeah. on public I, transit I access. Go where they are. I mean, you know. Maybe that's a thought. <laughs> so Emily, um, mm -hmm. you touched on this a little bit, but um, there's uh, many people are losing benefits right now or about to lose benefits mm -hmm. that were helping them out during the pandemic. People who were, in some cases, right on the margins, mm -hmm. right? So talk about what impact that's going to have here in Northeast Ohio. Absolutely. You know, during the pandemic, there was a lot of assistance for people um, recognizing the challenges that happened in 2020. You know, an eviction moratorium, a moratorium on cutting cutoffs for utilities, additional benefits for food and hunger, uh, both for students through the pandemic EBT program, for students that, that got free and reduced lunch at school, as well as for people who were on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP or food stamps, you know, stimulus payments, the child tax credit, there's a long list. Um, government and policy threw a lot of solutions at the problem um, to try and, and, and figure out- a lot of money too. A lot of money, mm -hmm. but it worked. We're seeing in the data that it worked. Our back of the envelope calculations show that if the child tax credit enhancements in 2021 had been made permanent, it would have lifted 10,000 Cleveland children out of poverty. Mm -hmm. Just that, that one action. 
you know, we're, we're leaving the pandemic behind. We're all moving on with life. Government has to do the same thing. And so many of the programs are being rolled back. The latest are uh, the reduction in SNAP. Research is showing that an average loss every month of $172 for Ohio families that are on SNAP, just out of their pockets um, and out of our, our economy. That's money that's spent locally at grocery stores and other places. Um, Additionally, we're seeing some changes to the Medicaid program. But on this point, Ohio is doing really well. Um, Ohio is doing an excellent job of keeping people on Medicaid that continue to qualify for it. 77% of people in the first month were re-enrolled. It's one of the top in the country. Oklahoma now, was only I, 19%. Can I ask about that work requirement that we've been hearing about oh, sure. on the federal level? Is, is that trickling down to Ohio? It will. It will. Um, and it's not just federal requirements. The state government right now, as they consider the budget, uh, the current budget has a number of proposals that will make it more difficult for people to access the benefits and to stay on the benefits that they qualify for. Work requirements, photo ID requirements, and SNAP, making it more difficult to reach out to Job and Family Services if you have a question or need to provide documentation. These are things that don't make the programs stronger they're expensive to administer, and they keep people from the benefits that they qualify for. But for some people who are not as well-versed in mm -hmm. this topic, they'll say, well, what's wrong with making able-bodied people work? It seems like everybody should pitch in, right? So can you talk about the nuances of that? Absolutely. That's the best solution. I mean, the fastest way for a family to move from poverty to self-sufficiency is a family-sustaining wage and a good job. No one will argue with that. It's, it's the best. The best thing we can do, the most permanent solution here, has to do with those labor market forces. The reality is that we have a lot of people in our community that have barriers to employment or challenges that make it difficult for them to find or maintain that employment. The good news is that a lot of employer practices are changing as well to recognize that, that people live in families, that sometimes workers lead complicated lives, that we've got to ask the question if we don't understand what we're seeing. If someone is turning down a raise or a promotion, ask the question why. It might be because they lose childcare support and they can't afford to make up the difference with the small raise that they're getting. And so this assessment United Way, other community partners are asking some of those questions, asking the question about why do we see these things persist, and are there levers that we might be able to do, or these simple solutions like lining up when a job starts <laughs> to when the bus <laughs> drops off in front of the, the workplace right. that help everyone. So do you see signs, though, that on the federal and state level that the legislators recognize there needs to be an opportunity for people to explain if they have some of these extenuating circumstances to maybe be able to continue to receive the help? You know, I wish I could say yes, but it's a challenging political environment for a lot of these issues that we work on. And so Community Solutions and others are spending a lot of our time educating okay. to bust some myths, so to speak, <laughs> to talk about the data, to talk about some of the challenges. And we find a lot, of, a lot of reception. We've all lived through the pandemic. Those of us with children saw what happens when you don't have child care that works mm -hmm. around your work schedule. Mm -hmm. And so I like to think that there is some empathy there that we can tap into. Just like after the housing crisis, we all saw that we could be just a paycheck or two away from foreclosure, and we got some amazing policies relating to mortgage assistance, to housing, right to counsel uh, for evictions here in our community. And so taking advantage of those opportunities to educate and to have some sustainable solutions to these problems. Gregory, the lawmakers, both statewide and nationally, say we can't afford it. We can't afford to keep funding these programs at the levels that they are, that they were during the pandemic. That was an emergency. The emergency's over. If we keep funding at these levels, we'll go broke. What do you say to that? I think that uh, as Emily and Jacob have both said, I think that there is truth to that, but that's not the whole story. If you look at it in terms of dollars in, dollars out, of course, you cannot, we have, we have a super evolving deficit that we're trying to put some brakes on at the federal level. 
Um, but the implications of that may be that as a result of doing the cost savings, we injure those people in our society who are least able to deflect what would happen to them. So we have to, and, and this is part of what I think is the evolving thinking that we're trying to promote, we have to think more comprehensively and understand the complexities of policy before we implement or make laws. The other thing we need to do is to understand how we use equity as the hallmark of our decision-making capacity. When I do political analysis or, or I look at public policy analysis, I look at four characteristics. I look at effectiveness, efficiency, political feasibility, and lastly, I look at equity. Who is it fair for? Who is it just to? And how? We don't do that very much in our political society right now, and that's unfortunate because I think if we would add that variable, we would be able to understand a lot more about what would the implications are when we put public policy in place and how we fund that. The other thing we have to do is we have to figure out how could we do a Marshall Plan for Europe, how could we do the Great Society, or how could we do what Roosevelt did to create a society where people could flourish. We have to do it in the 21st century now. And we have to understand 21st century conditions and also that the future of this country is really going to be whether we can sustain ourselves, not just politically, not just socially, but economically. And the only way to do that is to utilize the only resource we have that is abundant, and that's our people. We have to invest in our people, and we have to utilize our people as the hallmark of the way that we get out of these problems. Well, speaking of government funding, there are government dollars flowing through our community. The American Rescue Act dollars right. are in our community, in our city, and county governments are starting to spend them, right? So what do you think, Gregory, about how these dollars are being invested locally from the county and the city? I am very, very excited about the vast um, array of ideas and the vast array of opportunities that are being developed at our county and city uh, levels of government around how to use ARPA dollars and also how to then leverage those dollars to do other things. So I think that um, two things, first of all, I really appreciate the fact that both the city and, and county governments went into the community and asked community for input around what they wanted to see. That was a big, that was a big uh, thing that had not happened in the past. The second thing is that they are trying to figure out then how to address the concerns that would provide the most leverage and provide opportunity for us to seek additional dollars from additional sources. So they're thinking both specifically and also structurally. And to me, that's an example of what I was talking about earlier. People are starting to think about these complexities in a much broader sense. That's great. So, yeah. I'm glad to hear they're thinking structurally. So remember that you can get in on this conversation. Those of you who are listening, you can text the question to 216-307-5632. That's 216-307-5632. Five six three two. We'll be sharing those questions shortly, probably another ten minutes or so. So it's time to get those fingers moving and get some <laughs> questions into us. So Jacob, I wanted to ask you about our academic partners. Mm -hmm. You know, we have such wonderful academic institutions in our community. What is it that our employers need from our from the academic partners to make sure we're preparing people for the jobs that are out there? Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that we need is alignment. And that's not to suggest that, that one group is more at fault than the other. We already talked about the business responsibility. Um, but I also think we need to think differently about the way we have conversations, particularly with young people, about where opportunity is in the economy, how they take advantage of it, how they think about career paths, and how they start doing that at a much younger age. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, if you're going to talk about STEM talent, right, there's an abundant need for STEM talent in our community. That's not a conversation you can start having in the 10th and 11th grade. That's mm -hmm. a conversation that has to happen much, much earlier than that. So I think it's not just higher education, it's our entire education system. 
Uh, one of the ways that we've been thinking about that is we're partnering with high schools and higher education partners like Tri-C and Lorain County Community College to do a career by design program. Uh, career by design is intended to talk to their administrators, their faculty, and their staff about not just the types of degrees that they're granting, but how those degrees ultimately translate into opportunity in the economy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been, I think, a very engaging uh, set of conversations with employers at the table. And I think when you start to bring all those voices together, um, you can really see the impact that it can make. But I think we also have structural uh, state, and in some cases federal issues, that are keeping too many people out of the economy altogether and out of higher education. Um, we do uh, a tool. Is that such as the cost of tuition maybe it's, or something uh, like it's that? It's things like the cost of tuition, yeah. but it's also how hard it is if for whatever reason life gets in the way to get back on a pathway. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. If you, uh, we looked at some data nationally and compared Northeast Ohio to 12 other markets across the country. This is our Columbus's and Cincinnati's and Pittsburgh's, but also New York and San Francisco as aspirationally. Um, and if you look at a couple of data points, it's really telling. If you look at our bachelor's plus attainment rate, people with at least a bachelor's degree, we have the lowest, uh, with the lowest percentage of our population with one among all uh, the 13 total metros that we looked at. If you look at our some college starts, people who start down a pathway but don't complete, we have the second highest rate of people who are on a pathway that's but don't the, finish. Is that the Cleveland Metro we're talking? This, for us, talking it's Kyle Cleveland, Akron, Canton, Youngstown, the, the, whole, the 18 the counties. But it holds true for the Cleveland Ohio. Metro as okay. well. Um, and to me, to the point about what can we do, that screams action. Yes. How do we think about solutions mm -hmm. to this? And I think that's where the conversation has to go. I'm as guilty as anyone. Mm -hmm. We can talk about GDP and employment all day long. It's reports like the one that's being put out. Uh, it's, it's thinking differently about what's that next level of granularity and how do we influence that with policy? And that's where I think policy can be really effective and you start to see an ROI for that investment mm -hmm. you're making. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Emily, I asked this question earlier to Gregory in terms of like what's in the way, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, we, and you just mentioned s solutions. So what's in the way, Emily, of our local organizations and institutions coming together better to work on these, all these issues we've been talking about? Sure. You know, to, to flip the question a little bit, the thing that I um, am most pleased to see and excited about and think have, have a lot of the opportunity is a growing recognition of the whole person, the whole family, the wraparound. Mm -hmm. these, these conditions, positive or negative, they tend to go together. Yes. Um, and so just sort of addressing one area will help in that one area. But thinking about things holistically, you know, we like to say that if, if someone in a family is struggling, everyone in that family is struggling, whether That's it's true. with addiction or mental illness or having a tough time or job loss. Um, and so thinking about two generation strategies to work with parents and children at the same time or many generations at the same time. Um, can really help us overcome, break some of these negative cycles and are ways that we don't have to wait. Some of the solutions that have the greatest return on investment when you run the numbers are things that you work with with children, things like early care and education. Mm -hmm. Very important, but we're going to have to wait 20 years until the five-year-olds of today are the 25-year-olds entering or, or really getting kick-starting their careers. We don't have time to wait. Okay. So we need to look at things that can help right now and look toward the future. It's exactly what Greg had mentioned. You know, deal, stabilize things right now and then build toward the future. So both and strategy. And our community has the resources, we have the know-how, we have the will to be able to do those things. And you know, one of the things that I was, we're, we've been talking a lot about jobs and mm -hmm. that really we're implying that we're talking about younger people here, college. Mm -hmm get into the job market, et cetera. But I was surprised that our seniors are not doing so great, mm -hmm. uh, you know, according to our assessment, right? What are we seeing out there as the greatest needs for seniors? Um, it, Gregory, is it housing? Uh, what, what are the seniors facing in our community? Well, I think the first thing is, is we need to get back to understanding that uh, before we created Social Security, we had a problem with poverty as it related to our elderly population. And what got most people out of poverty when they became 65 or older was Social Security. <coughs> Uh, we have to figure out how to stabilize that fund so that it'll be available for people. The other thing we have to do is think about opportunities to employ people who have experience. Just because you have gray hair doesn't mean that you are lost 
uh, and can't bring it every day. I see a little gray over yeah, there. Well, I got a lot of gray, so. and, uh, <laughs> and I earned every 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 curly Q here. So the, no need to push you yeah. out just because you're That's gray. right. And, and and but the other piece is we have to think about it once again, not just in in, in, in terms of employment or pl employment opportunities, but healthcare, proximity to work, neighborhood safety and development. All of those things really do when we what we call the social determinants of health really do support the, and buoy people's ability to participate in the labor force. So to the extent that we understand and start to manufacture solutions that are more comprehensive but really do lift up those elements, then we're going to have people who can sustain whatever economic crisis might come forward. And, and I just want to say one other thing, too. Um, I think we need to understand, too, that we operated in the 20th century paradigm that when people got to be 65, they retired. That is no longer the case. People are living into their 90s now on average for some groups. So we have to think about post-65 kinds of social structures and what do we do with all those folks because that population could be a source of great great opportunity for us. I was thinking about that, Jacob, when we were talking about our needs for employees. Are employers thinking about that? How do we rehire some seniors who maybe have retired from a previous job or some seniors who've maybe been sitting out for a while? Are, are, are we thinking about that locally? Uh, we are. And so what's more common, though, is uh, employers are doing everything possible they can to hold on to that worker yes. to the very last <laughs> moment. Uh, and it's catching up with us. Uh, yes. If you yes. look at the demographics, which we started with, of, of our labor force, we're 5 to 10 percent older than the country as a whole. Right. Uh, we're not replacing it with younger people. And uh, the younger people we are replacing that demographic with um, tend to not be pushed into some of the in-demand careers that we see. And I'll just mm -hmm. give you an example. Uh, production workers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Rust Belt narrative has driven a lot of the perception around manufacturing. Yes, it's yes. still the second largest sector of jobs and the largest sector of output in the Northeast Ohio economy. Um, the challenge we have is that a significant portion of that workforce is above 55. Uh, and we don't necessarily have a clear strategy for how we're going to replace some of those jobs. So it's hold on to that worker as long as you can. Uh, but that goes away at some point. My mom worked full time, just retired at 70. She got a part time job because she was bored. Um, but it's also about thinking differently about, I think, that structural replacement. You know, people 65, 70 should be in a position where they work if they want to. And then we know that's not always the case, right? right? right. Um, but we also have to be thinking about the other end of the funnel, uh, or else this, this talent gap that we see is going to persist. Gosh, I was thinking about retiring early, but I guess that's not going to be on the table, huh? So, you know, um, Jacob, I have two kids. I have a boy and a girl. I got a set. They're all grown, grown up now. My daughter's 26, and my son is in college. He's 20. What can I do to get them? What do we need to do collectively to get them to come back here? My daughter's in New York. My son's in college away. I want him to come back home. What, what can we do to get the young people back? Yeah, well, you're clearly not guilting them enough. Uh, <laughs> I, I yes. think that's the best place to start is guilt. And uh, hopefully if that's they... That's a good strategy. Yeah, I might uh, want to try that if they have kids, um, If they have kids, uh, hopefully they need some, some help. They don't need to so, have kids yet. They don't right, need grandma. So you got to encourage that kids. now, too. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think th one of the things that we try to do, look, getting someone to move um, when they when they've settled somewhere else is often a challenging value proposition. The area where we, seeing it, we see it happening the most is for jobs and for family. Um, and it tends to be, at least for the demographic we work with, people who are in their mid-30s to you know, uh, early 40s thinking about that next phase of their career, thinking about maybe a different environment that they want to live in. Um, there's no silver bullet, and, uh, but it's incredibly important. And there are efforts taking place. The Cleveland Talent Alliance right now has just gotten started looking at retaining and keeping more college students, for instance, that are here in the marketplace. But I've got a 21-year-old 20, who's at Kent, um, uh, doesn't necessarily know if she wants to stay here. I have a 9-year-old who wants to be a YouTuber. They all want to be YouTubers. All want to be YouTubers. What is it with that? You, when you write <laughs> reports on talent and your own kids don't listen to you, you got to work. <laughs> on it, but uh, the, the, no easy solution to well, that. Well, YouTubing, they may be able to just stay here. We'll see. So, yeah. so you're not guilting enough either. It, clearly not. No. <laughs> no, clearly not. Well, I think it's just about time for us to move into our questions section, right? 
right? Yep. Okay, so um, if you, if, can I get the, the phone number again one more time for folks to text in? The number is 216-307-5632. 216-307-5632. And we do have some questions already lined up from our audience. And so we're going to start to share your questions now. The first question I have here is please address the impact of the recent changes to the voter ID law laws on the poor. How can people become civically engaged to impact policy that can help them escape poverty if they can't vote. So Emily, I'm gonna ask you to address that one. Um, the voter ID laws, we have had some changes here in Ohio, right? Yes, yes, we have had some changes. <laughs> had some changes here in Ohio on voter ID laws. There is the, the election coming up in August to change, potentially change the way that constitutional amendments are Oh, can you uh, talk about on. that a little bit? Because I don't think many folks have the details sure, on that Sure, sure. So the proposal uh, that will be put forth to voters in August is to change the threshold for um, putting in a constitutional amendment to from 50% of voters, you know, so half of voters, to 60%. So making it more difficult for uh, voters and for, for Ohio residents to amend the Constitution. Um, yeah, lots um, of groups have come out against it. <laughs> so people <laughs> will have a chance to vote on that in August? They will have a chance to vote on it. Okay, and a vote no August. means what? A vote no means that it stays the way that it is now. And a vote yes means it goes to 60%. It goes to, to a threshold that we don't hold our legislators to, make it even more difficult. And I understand that there's a couple uh, like citizen ballot in initiatives that are mm -hmm. coming down the line that some mm -hmm. folks in Columbus aren't happy to see. Yeah, definitely so not. this is sort of aimed at that, right? This absolutely. It's it's aimed to make it more difficult to get things on the ballot, to pass things from the ballot. Okay. Um, really shifting at the base level, shifting the power to Columbus. So getting back though to the, qu mm -hmm. the basic question, so voter ID. Voter ID. What can we do other than lobby our legislators on that? Yeah, you know, I think it comes back to some of those issues that Greg mentioned about equity, who's most impacted by some of these changes. Um, and, and it is a real challenge. And so, you know, some of the grassroots efforts need to shift from just encouraging people to get to the polls to trying to get people those photo IDs, um, overcoming some of the barriers and just getting there the barriers in filling out the paperwork and the cost of having that photo ID and making sure that people are familiar with what their rights are, what their what the requirements are so that they're not surprised when they show up okay. and try and cast their ballot. So just making sure the people are ready when they show up and they have mm -hmm. those ideas. And you know, and continuing, any policy that's put in place can always be changed, can be taken out again. Um, so continuing some of those, but really trying to help people right now be able to exercise the right to vote. Okay, our next question is that over the pandemic, we saw a reduction in people experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. United, Way, United Way 211, though, is seeing an increase in calls for shelter rental, and rental assistance. How can we address a potential crisis of housing instability? Mm -hmm. Gregory, would you like to take that one? Uh, I'll, give it a, I'll give it a whirl. You'll give it a shot? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, once again, I think the issue is not just about a person not having a place to live permanently because what you find out is is that many people have issues that uh, cause them to be homeless and we have to think about what those issues are whether it's a physical health issue a financial issue a mental health issue all of those issues contribute to the idea of homelessness but I think one of the things and I was I was talking with um, City Council President Blaine Griffin a few months ago and he was talking about the need for Cleveland to really look at the idea of how they create more affordable housing opportunities because we've lost a lot in the last uh, five, ten years. Um, what did we lose that to? We, demolition and, and the condition of those houses not being up to standard. They weren't, and then, really, they weren't really great houses. It wasn't have, great housing right. stock anyway. And then you have the saying. lead issue on top of that as well. So mm -hmm. that, makes, that makes it uh, a little bit more cost prohibitive for people to rent. Um, but I think that the issue of homelessness increasing is we have to, once again, marshal our resources locally. We have, we have an abundance of assets in this community. And we're starting to understand that we can do a heck of a lot more if we work together than we can trying to do it individually. I think the new leadership has been very positive, whether it's at the county or the city or these nonprofit organizations or our philanthropic community. We've got new leadership 
ev almost everywhere. And these new leaders are coming in and they're asking the tough questions. Why aren't we working together? Why aren't we seeing better outcomes for the people that live here? Those are the right questions to ask. So whether it's homelessness or mental health or behavioral health or whether it's food insecurity or environmental conditions, those are the things we need to think about. And in doing so, we can create a community that is beneficial for all and not just for some. Well, I'm so glad to hear that, that these new leaders coming in are asking those tough questions, because we have seen a sea change locally yeah. in a lot of major institutions. And, I, and it feels like there's new energy in the community to me. Do you guys agree with that? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. A, a new commitment to try, to try to get at some of these. So we also have a question about how does immigration factor into our shared future as a community? And I was thinking about that as you were talking, Jacob, and I was wondering, is immigration a possible solution to bring new people into our community, or what do you think about that? It certainly should be, um, uh, but unfortunately, it's it's not the easiest uh, solution right now. Right. Um, and uh, you have to have, uh, you know, a company who is willing to to take on that process. Um, and uh, oftentimes, some of the challenges that go along with that, uh, companies aren't willing to. Uh, take that either monetary risk or just the risk that you know there's no guarantee you'll have have that worker or, or that individual um, when that process is done. You know this is probably more of a Jacob opinion than a Tim Neo opinion mm -hmm. because uh, we don't really deal with immigration policy. Right, but right. Um, uh, you know it's just a critical issue that needs fixed. It needs fixed yeah. on so many yeah. levels. Um, and I do think it's going to be the closest thing in the short term that we can find. Um, to a complex solution, not just for uh, Northeast Ohio or Greater Cleveland, but for a lot of our Midwest counterparts mm -hmm. who are dealing with some of these same issues. Um, but it, unfortunately, uh, it's outside the hands of the region, in many c cases outside the hands of the state, and we're really dealing with a set of federal policies yeah. um, that, that haven't yeah. seemed to move all that much. Yeah, because you think about like where are the places that you can look to that have faced the same problem that you have, right? And I know in a lot of uh, European countries, for example, when they saw that their population was aging, they opened up and allowed more immigration so that you have more younger people working. And that sounds like a good idea to me, but you know, like you said, we got to deal with this federal policy. Okay, we have another question that says, while Ohio lost population, the Latino population grew. What are we learning about this community from the data? I think Emily, can you take that one? Sure. I, that you know, that's one of the things that we see in the data is that every succeeding generation is more diverse in terms of race, race and ethnicity than the ones that have gone before, and so communities really need to to grapple with that. Um, you know, we see some surprising things when we look at the data in this particular needs assessment um, with the Hispanic or the Latino population. One of them is that home ownership rates, even at lower incomes, are quite high for people uh, with Hispanic or Latinx heritage in our community. You know, really wanting to, we take that as an indication, wanting to put down roots, mm -hmm. stay in place, invest in this community, stay long term. Um, we see some real differences uh, in, in educational attainment and some of the types of jobs that different groups of people are getting. Um, and it's, so it's something that, you know, when we think about where will population growth come from, it could come from immigration, but it's going to come from diversity more mm -hmm. than anything else. And so figuring out how companies, how organizations, how society, how our community can embrace some of those differences and help all different kinds of people be successful. I think I'm speaking your language you right are. now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, to me, that's the key to our future success. Yeah, you know, speaking of that, Gregory, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been following closely in my role at IdeaStream is how, you know, these structures you've been talking about, yeah. how racism has influenced a lot of the, these structures and barriers that are in the way to people succeeding in our community. And I know you touched on it a little bit, but can you talk a little bit more about how, what we can do to get at these systemic barriers that are the result of you know, legacies from the past and, and, and racism in our community. Yeah, I will, I will be happy to try to address that. I think it's, it's the thing that I kind of work a lot about, especially the last 15 years. Um, um, I was recruited to participate in a national uh, process that was looking at the issue of racial and health equity and, and how do you really 
develop strategic and, and, and structural approaches uh, in communities and uh, was part of a 26 city um, kind of, of um, work group that we spent time thinking and then working kind of in a laboratory sense. There's no doubt that the implications of slavery historically and discrimination and oppression currently uh, have had just deleterious effects on people of color, especially African Americans. But you know, if you look at Asians or you look at Latinx folks or all of us in some way, and now we move to gender bias now, so that we're we're looking at um, how do we deal with people who are transgender or we're going after LGBTQ folk. I mean, it just you know, the, the idea is there's. There's always been a demonization of the other or an alien kind of person assignment in this country. What it does is it undermines our ability to optimize the potential of every individual in society. That was okay in the 20th century because we were more about learning and understanding and growing and melding people together. But the 21st century is about diversity and inclusion because we have a demographic shift now that is starting to, as, as Emily said, each, each successive population group and each successive uh, trend is demonstrating that our population is gonna be more and more diverse. So that means we have to start to understand what diversity and inclusion means and how do we then Im impact equity in a way that it becomes an output um, and an outcome. So what I would say is this, we got to start with the hearts and minds of people, both. Some people will listen to the, the thing that we need to do it for the benefit of doing good things or the public good. Some people understand that it's an economic benefit and we need to do it for economic purposes. But we need to understand that regardless of what we may think or how we may feel, it is inevitable that our society is going to be diverse and we're going to have to create a diverse society systemically and practically to meet that demand. You know, Ohio, I was looking at the data, and Ohio's a little slower yes. than some other areas yes. of the country. Yes. I think I read that the minority population is about 20% in Ohio and about 40% locally in Cuyahoga County. So um, to your point, Emily, it, it's changing, but it's changing a little slower in Ohio, which is kind of a challenge because if people don't see it, they don't necessarily see the urgency to, well, let's embrace this or, or think about the policies that we need to do. But it's coming, as you say, even mm -hmm. in Ohio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe we can learn from places that have had to, yes. that have been forced, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe a little before we have. There, there's some solutions out there that we can learn from. Now, one of the things that also that I cover a lot is the infant mortality rate in Cleveland. And it's kind of related to what we were talking about, Gregory, because the African-American infant mortality rate, the numbers are just really dismal in Cleveland. They're, they're getting better. And I was really excited to read that Birthing Beautiful Communities, which is one of those organizations that's really making a difference in that space, that they're getting more money, they're getting ready to open up a birthing center in the Huff neighborhood, which that's the good news, yes. right? But the bad news is there's still a lot of work to be done there. So what, what can we do to move that needle on our infant mortality rates? I'm telling you, because we get a bad rap around the country for this one. You know, it's interesting that you say that because that's kind of one of the good news um, aspects of what we could talk about in terms of change. You know, historically, it took a lot of time for people to listen to leaders from the black community about the issue of infant mortality and morbidity in our community. Um, to be able to come up with the data to demonstrate that the, the disparities were not just about a certain uh, group, the low income women. It was throughout every sector of the strata, financial strata or economic All black strata. Women. Yeah, so if no if matter you, what. If, mm -hmm. if you could be a wealthy black woman or a poor black woman, the outcome is about the same. Okay? So that means it's not just about the people and that's where everything was focused. It was on well black women need to do better. On their behavior. Right. Now we move to what are the systemic barriers and challenges that 
people encounter when they try to utilize the systems. And when you talk about um, organizations coming together to think about this comprehensively and working together, whether it's the government, philanthropy, nonprofit organizations, community members are all coming together now to think about how do we do it. And that's what's led to that improvement in that data point. Um, what we say, though, is if we want to have significant improvement, we got to double down, triple down, quadruple down more on that strategy. And uh, birthing you find beautiful communities, mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to give them more resources because they're culturally sensitive. That's one thing that we found about the, the, the systems. We needed to be more culturally sensitive. But the other thing is that they're using processes that help to connect to the individual person. So it's a twofold approach. One is systemic, one is individual. So when you find something that works, double down. Double on down it. on it, triple <laughs> down, quadruple down on it. So Jacob, I'm going to give you the opportunity to, to end our discussion for us today. And what's your final message to the business community from what you've learned from this data? Yeah, and I think it was Greg who touched on it. There are a lot of reasons we should all care about these issues, right? I mean, but one of them is the economic imperative mm -hmm. that is thinking about things differently, thinking about our labor force, our workforce differently, thinking about connecting people to more opportunities. Um, I started by saying we're not going to grow our way out of this. Uh, that remains the challenge that we have today. So if you want to thrive, if you want to succeed, if you want to grow, uh, we need to be creative as businesses, as a community, about how we think about opportunity uh, and how we give more opportunity to more people that are here right now and disconnected from it. Well, that's a great spot to end on. I'd like to thank you all for being here. This has been just such a wonderful discussion. And I would like to now introduce Carice Turner-Smith, Director of Grant Making and Community, and Community Partnership at United Way of Cleveland to close our event. Carice. Thank you, Marlene Harris-Taylor, for moderating today's discussion, and to Gregory Brown, Emily Campbell, and Jacob Doritsky for an engaging and informative conversation. Thank you, IdeaStream Public Media and WOVU 95.9 FM, who live streamed today's conversation. And thank you to all of you for joining us today to advance understanding and encourage engagement and dialogue in this important topic to all of us. To access United Way's Community Needs Assessment, please visit United Way's website at unitedwaycleveland.org. United Way uses the data in the needs assessment to inform the work of the Community Hub for Basic Needs, which funds programs in three strategic areas, economic mobility, health pathways, and housing stability. The Community Hub for Basic Needs is now accepting requests for ideas from organizations serving Cuyahoga and Geauga County residents. The RFI process closes tomorrow, Friday, June 16th at 5 p.m. Requests for full proposals will be issued in mid-July with grant determinations made in late fall 2023 and funding beginning in January 2024. For more information about this grant cycle, please visit United Way's website at unitedwaycleveland.org. In addition, information on our next community conversation discussion will be available in August on United Way's website at unitedwaycleveland.org. All community conversation events are complimentary and open to all. Thank you for being with us today and have a good afternoon.